What's up, everybody? I'm back in the USA doing episode 28 with Jason and Matt. We talk about China. We talk about bankruptcy. We talk about luxury. Probably a good 20, 30 minutes just chopping about luxury. Anyway, shout out our sponsors. Fulfill, our tier one sponsor, Send Lane. Everything email and SMS under one roof for a low, comfortable price with great, great service. And North Beam, they just released their white paper. It's in our Slack. You can also email them. They'll give it to you. Thank you for listening. Episode 28. Let's get into it. So we got a bunch of topics to cover today. We got China, we have Hello Bello, we have celebrity, we have luxury. So maybe, Sean, you're jet lagged as hell. You warned us coming into this. Do you want to kick us off and let's talk China? Because I know Jason wants to, to talk China too. And just give us the like, what were you doing there? Maybe a highlight or two. You've had some insights in the chat that I think are interesting, worth sharing. Why don't you start us off? Let's talk China. Yeah. So I, I, I've been gone for like two weeks. I spent a week in uh, Tokyo. And then before that, I was in Hong Kong and Shenzhen. So uh, Hong Kong is probably one of the best cities on earth. I mean, top five easily. If you haven't been to Hong Kong, you should definitely go because- I have not. Oh, dude. I mean, what the amazing thing about Hong Kong is it's an international city, visa-free travel. You can just show up and people speak English. Your credit cards work. It's awesome. It like- it really feels like, you know, New York City, but way cleaner. And, you know, there's absolutely no taxes. So the way they make all of their revenue is by land leases. And so because of that, it's actually the most forested city on earth. Like it's in the like the jungle. It's in deep forest. There's mountains like right next to skyscrapers. It has more forest than anywhere and it has more skyscrapers than anywhere. So like it's like a very unique, lush place, and it's going to go away. Like you know, it, it'll be it'll be rolled up into mainland China in twenty five years, and the culture will basically be gone. So see it while you can see it. It's awesome. Uh, and then yeah, I went to the Canton Fair and I hung out with my suppliers. Uh, the The only real takeaway is, you know, <laughs> I post about this on Twitter, but. In the West, we often see China as a monolith, like the CCP moving in direct, you know, retaliation against the West. And it's just, it's not true. <laughs> it's like, it's a big country with a bunch of people and like, it's a loosely held together system, just like anything else. It is as chaotic as the West. Like, you know, the the government has com- competing interests and people inside there that have different things they want to get done. Like case in point, like... They are, they have a manufacturing class that has to now diversify into different countries because there's tariffs going into America. So like they have a manufacturing class that has built factories all throughout, you know, Southeast China and they're going to Vietnam now, they're going into Latin America so they can make stuff to sell in America without tariffs and be competitive on a world stage. And I talked to a lot of factory owners that the Belt and Road Initiative is just about trying to find markets to sell it because Western consumption is changing. We're favoring mm. different types of goods. And they like- Can you expand on that? What do you mean? Like Western consumption is changing. I, I So I'll give you the, like the, the quick context and I'm curious to hear if you just see the same, hear the same, Jason. Like I'm always asked investors, like when I'm talking about Lomi, like are you looking to diversify manufacturing out of China? Are you concerned about geopolitical risk? And Sean, what you just said is interesting. Like these are Chinese manufacturers that are are actually, so diversifying out of China still means like you're dealing with a Chinese manufacturer, but maybe in Vietnam or Bangladesh or India or somewhere else. Like, so can you just like unpack what you just said on like Western tastes or Western consumers changing and how does that impact how like China is thinking about where they're making things? Right. Because the tariffs thing is part of it, but that's not all of it. Right. So why did manufacturing go to China? It's because they were low cost manufacturing. Why did it go to Korea before or Japan before? It's like these are low cost manufacturing centers and China is no longer a low cost manufacturing center. It's being outclassed in soft goods by Vietnam or Bangladesh or wherever else. And 
the theory is that in the long run, eventually manufacturing will become localized through AI and automation so that yep. Mexico ends up being way cheaper or Arizona or wherever, right? Um, so they're, if they're losing out on low-cost manufacturing, that is amplified by the geopolitical risk of tariffs. I don't think there's going to be a war or breakout or thing like that. Nobody wants that. There's too much money to be made. But Donald Trump passed tariffs. Joe Biden didn't reverse them. <laughs> so it's it's I think the the center of the country, you know, 80% of the country is is on is in favor of Chinese tariffs and those are going to continue. And they see that coming, so they're diversifying their supply chain to meet Western brands where where they need to be. So mm. it'll be. I mean, I talked to a large luggage manufacturer in China who was pitching us on a new factory they built in the Caribbean. They're like, "Wow, yeah." And I'll I'll send over. It's it's I, I can't pronounce the name of the island, but it's they call it TT. It's like. Tr- Tr- Trinidad and Tobago, I think is what it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So they just, yeah, they built a factory there to sell Samsonite luggage that's made there because they wanted to get around tariffs. And like every very sophisticated manufacturer in China is doing shit like that. They're pitching you Vietnam, they're pitching you, you know, Africa, they're pitching you other places that are owned and operated by Chinese companies. But yeah, we're getting it a lot. Jason, are you guys seeing that at Hexclad? Well, there's a lot that we just talked about. There's a lot to unpack there. But in terms of the manufacturing diversification argument, I don't know if I mentioned this on a on a on one of the earlier pods, but you know, we we work a lot with JP Morgan and they were telling me that like all of their big coverage bankers, all like at all the big public companies, everyone is talking about how to diversify out of China. It's a very, very big topic of conversation with um, all the big men, anyone who manufactures something. I want to go back for a second, though, to because how Sean started it, I think, is a really interesting perspective. You know, people love to conflate the population with the government. And, <laughs> you know, I, I just I think that's in that just lacks intelligence and like hating china hating chinese goods like you can hate the chinese regime and and still like not hate the people and and not hate the look corporate america outsourced its manufacturing capability to china via the you know the wto entry and and just the profit motive and that's what happened and sean rightly points out that with automation um there may come a time where and also just just there's other lower cost places that like it moves on from china and that's why i was most interested to hear from sean about china because i'm i'm very interested unless you go to a place you know just reading what's in the media you just don't know and I haven't had the ability to go to China because when I joined Hexcloud, it was in the middle of pandemic and and we couldn't go for three years. And members of our team have gone a couple of times recently. In fact, one of our guys is there right now, but I just haven't been able to fit it into my schedule. I'm excited to go there. I, I, I hear amazing things about Hong Kong. I also hear amazing things about Shanghai. I heard Shanghai is like just like an incredible city. Cole, one of the co-founders of Hexclad, loves loves Shanghai. But the issue that we have with coming out of China right now, I think, is that we require so much steel in our production. And and even if you can do the automation, uh, which our factory in in we we manufacture in, in multiple countries, not just China, but we do a lot of stuff in China. And our factory in China is continuing to invest in automation. And so I love that. And I feel like maybe we can go to Mexico. Maybe we can go to Vietnam. Maybe we can go to India at some point. If we want to sell in India, we probably can't bring it in from China anyway. Um, but I'm just fascinated no. by and and the, the China market as well is one that's really interested interesting to me. So I'd, I'd love to understand how brands actually sell, U, U.S. brands, luxury brands actually sell D2C in in China. I think that's really an interesting conversation. Sean, have you explored that at all? 
like now that you've been over there, is that top of mind for you? What Jason's saying? Yeah, we're, I mean, it's no secret that I have a factory in Arizona and we're making stuff right now. And in Q1, we're going to have a global store live with US made inventory that's, you know, designed to sell into China as a market. Um, mm. Now, Jason, you were talking about like, yeah, people shouldn't hate, you know, people in different countries and they should focus like that hate on the regime or the government. I would go so far as to say, I don't even think people understand what our government's doing, let alone what other governments are doing. <laughs> like, <laughs> like no one has any goddamn idea. Just like until like if you, if you go to China and talk to people, it's the closest business culture to America. I've said that dozens of times. It is closer to America than European business culture. They're just like, hey, we want to get shit done and we care about making money. I've never met people who are more into making money than the Chinese. And- hmm. There is just as much hate towards their government as if you talk to any American how much we hate our government. They're trying to take all my money. That's what like the de facto response is. But yeah, we're going to try to sell them to China. I think China is a great market. They're investing in automation because they have all the same problems we have. Like there's not enough people to work in the factories and they have youth unemployment because the unemployment, it's like it's like 20% for young men or something. Like they don't take the factory jobs because the factory jobs suck and don't pay enough to have the apartments. It's like the exact same problem about like if you go down like any service industry job, right? Like bars can't get enough people, restaurants can't get enough people because like those jobs don't pay enough to live, right? It's the exact same problem that that we're facing. And our, our solution is immigration. And you talked to that about them is they're like, I asked a, like a ton of people like factories and like, why don't you guys just bring in immigrants? They're like, we've, they're like, we've never even thought of that. <laughs> they're like, there's, they're like, there's no way to get immigrants here. <laughs> they're like, they're like, it's an impossible task, but. That's actually, I mean, yeah, I, then that's correct. Cause like our U S and Canada have massive immigration muscle. Like that's literally what builds our countries. Cause we don't have kids anymore. Right. Like Canada needs to import a weird amount of people every year relative to our population size. Otherwise our country would collapse. Yeah, dude, America like, America's the same way. And you know, UK, yeah. we we have that that ability and China just doesn't. So Sean, do you think like and you're gonna so I mean what blows my mind is that you're gonna do made in America goods so that you can and part of that is so that you can sell into China. Cause in China they want made in America. Am I reading that right? Like they don't want their own stuff. Yeah. Made in China? Yeah. They, I mean, talk to Chinese consumers, which I did. And they're like, yeah, I don't want shit made here. They're like, they want luxury goods. They want, you, yeah. know, you know, things that are imported and special. I mean, that's just a tale as old as time, right? Like why does made in Italy sell so well? Oh, totally. Yeah. Why does, why does France and Italy like own the luxury market? Um, and yeah, that's also why I went to Tokyo. I spent a week in Tokyo, like made in America is huge there. Um, yeah. So yeah, we want, I'm going to try doing that. And if that works, I'm going to open a factory in Japan. I'm going to open a factory in Italy. Like, you know, I, I'm going to I'm going to go hyper localized and export that stuff to other markets. That's that's kind of my my next couple of years. Yeah, I can see Jason this being hard for you guys, given your your steel inputs. Um, my family's in the steel business in Italy, and it's uh, China. Just like they buy so much of it. And there's like, a, a, as a, on a price per kilo or whatever they, however they pay for it, it's just difficult to get that amount of volume. Yeah. Our manufacturer is um, actually, our manufacturing partner who we're very close with because they're basically, we're basically a hundred percent of their business um, is talking about basically buying their own steel factory. Like they're buying, they got their own packaging factory now. They've got their own handle, fa like they're just totally vertically integrating the entire process, but just getting the steel out of China is still, um, yeah, I haven't done a lot of homework on it, but it's, it's like saying that you're American made, but importing the steel. And then I'm not sure what the tariff situation is on steel and, and everything else. Yeah. I think we're good on China guys. Like I, I think at some future point, Sean, I'd love to, on an episode, we should dig into like maybe more of how you're specifically thinking about, like tactically thinking about selling in China. Cause I think there's a lot of American brands that would, that sounds really attractive, but I think for today, like I got a bunch of takeaways on your, on your trip. So that's great. Dude. I think, I think the future for American brands is selling into APAC. I mean, yep. 
talking about Tokyo, there's a ton of people there and a lot of them are super rich. So that was like the, the like the shocking takeaway is just ha- dude in Hong Kong, there is I think I think I saw six Romola stores. Like globally, there's only 30. It's like there's so many fucking people in APAC who have yeah. money and are emerging out of poverty and who want to buy luxury brands. Yeah, man. And I mean, I, I've been I think I was talking to you guys in chat. I've been telling everybody, I'm like, dude, I think I'm gonna get rich to a billion in revenue in like four years, and I'm gonna focus on APAC to get that done. It's like and I'm not gonna be happy until I hit that number. So that's what I'm working <laughs> on. I just gotta have a goal. <laughs> so Jason, round number. why don't round you take number. us away? What well, where's your well, head at these yeah, days? Yeah, so like the last thing on that topic, and then I have something else I want to discuss was um we're actually launching Japan next week. Hmm. If uh if our cookware actually is allowed out of customs. <laughs> so it's like been sitting in customs. It's the first container we've we've shipped there. And we've got like an event planned and everything else. And and uh, yeah, the only issue uh, is we've got this amazing event planned, but um, don't have any cookware there yet. And it's been, uh, it's like, there's always, it's like whack-a-mole, right guys? Like running businesses like ours, it's absolute whack-a-mole. It's like, I got a call from Jeff. He's like, hey, just FYI, we might, I might be sending cookware on an airplane with some Hexclad employees <laughs> for this event. <laughs> It's ridiculous. <laughs> That's awesome. And they're going to get stuck at customs too, by the way, because it's like, why are you bringing in 300 pounds of pans? <laughs> but uh, during the last pod when uh, Sean wasn't there, but we were talking about, I was mentioning um, some of the goals that I said at the beginning of the year and how they'd been turning out. And I was also thinking about this over the weekend with our ops. And, you know, last year, this time, ops w- was pretty scary. I mean, it got really scary like a couple of weeks before BFCM and was one of my top three initiative this year initiatives this year. And, and, a, and a big part of that was onboarding with fulfill. Uh, we went from a bunch of Google sheets to with just our warehouse. And then back in October of last year, we set up a three PL in Tennessee. Uh, we now have, another location so we've got three locations you know our business is up a hundred percent this year we have been front loading orders since june it's like the stress on the system i should be losing my mind over this right now and it's like it's going too well and i know for a fact that a big part of this is fulfill because we've been able to really connect everything up um and know where everything is. And it's, I'm, I'm like shocked with, ha- with the <laughs> lack of panic at Hexclad right now. Thanks, thanks, in, thanks to Fulfill and a couple of key hires. Um, it, it's been, it's like, it's incredible. Like uh, we still have the October scaries because of all this investment in cookware. But sure. I mean, our numbers in in October have been insanely good, by the way. And so, going into going into um, a couple weeks from now, I mean, we'll, we'll see when we get there. But I'm very confident in our ability to handle things. And there's no way we would be able to get there this year if we had not implemented Fulfill. Those guys went above and beyond. We beat them up about a bunch of stuff that we needed. We went back and forth. They explained to us our their opinion, and there were a number of things that we wanted that we just didn't need or just didn't mm. make sense. We weren't thinking about it the right way, and they they showed us the right way. And on the other hand, there were a couple of things that we really wanted them to do for us, and they bent to our will and did a really nice job. So uh, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to enjoy Thanksgiving a lot more, refreshing Shopify and Amazon Seller Central with uh, without being in a complete panic so i'm pretty happy weren't right you now. in the warehouse last year at that time oh, like yeah. weren't you like like you were in it oh, yeah. last year every year every year i think it might just be ceremonial this year finally just go in uh, there with a bottle of champagne and <laughs> enjoy it man well that's that's hell of a testimonial dude uh i know mitab has also switched over and he's a he's a i mean he's been a friend of the pod and dude he's a killer operator so that's great to hear about fulfill 
if you can impress me tab i mean you can, I just, you can impress anybody i know that's why i think he's my benchmark for choosing vendors vendors it's like if i know that a reference from him he's they've gone through hell to win his business <laughs> they're either they're either really good or you can default on paying them and they can't sue you that's yeah. that are the two things he's like both <laughs> so uh i want to switch topics i'd love to maybe start with you on this one sean but um let's talk hello bello so this has happened in the last like couple weeks i can't get a read on this i don't know if this is just like a restructure of a bunch of debt or if this is like fundamentally a business that just doesn't work, Sean, maybe start us off. And Jason, I mean, your your banking and, and legal background can probably give some value here, but take us away, Sean. No, Matt, you're totally right. It's just a restructure. I, everyone loves to like pound like the oh my god, the doomist point of view on this, and like the fact that they went to bankruptcy with a stalking horse bid which for everyone who doesn't know that's basically someone the day you enter bankruptcy you come you come to bankruptcy with them being like hey here's an offer on the table to buy us out of bankruptcy these people are already committed to this amount of money and that that basically guarantees that they get to buy it like unless there's it's very rare for that bid to fall apart and the reason for that is that bankruptcy courts are ran by the government and it's an overworked person. So if they show up and they're like, hey, I have a bid, that bid typically just gets it. Hmm. Um, so the fact they showed up with a bid, here's my guess. I've never talked to anybody there, but here's my guess. They had an okay business that's probably unprofitable that couldn't sell to PE and had a bunch of debt and a bunch of preferred shares. And they go to bankruptcy, they wipe all of that out. It goes to, you know, uh, this this new bidder. I think it's sixty seven million dollars that satisfies a lot of the debt. Maybe some of the investors get some dollars back, and they re incentivize management with a new equity pool. And management being the celebrities involved. I bet. Right. I think it's Kristen Dunst and Dak Shepard, or yep. Kristen Bell and Dak Shepard, Kristen whatever. Bell. Yeah, yeah. They end up getting twenty percent of the company, and they're more involved now. Um, cause there's a new management pool. So hmm. look, it's, it's probably an actually a good outcome for everybody, but creditors, <laughs> everybody, but who owes them money. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's any, look, there's some bad deals that have happened. There's some very alarming things that have happened. This isn't one of them. They have revenue. They're going to continue. They'll probably bump around $80 million. They'll probably lose over half their revenue or whatever, but they'll turn a profit and they'll be in the hands of PE. Jason, yeah. any, any other thoughts? Sean, yeah, yeah, Jason, I have a lot of thoughts think? on this. I have a lot of thoughts on this. I agree with Sean a lot of it, but you know, so they reset the cap table. Uh, you know, the, I actually think it's a really well done. Whoever ran this process is really well done because it's clear what happens in these cases. I've seen it a lot with tech companies in my day, not, not so much with uh, retail brands, but investors just didn't want to continue to fund it. Right. They just didn't believe it anymore. And they managed to go and get someone else in there to to clean it up um, and reset the cap table. So I, I think it's actually a very well executed outcome um, on the overall story of Hello Bellows business. Moyes Ali actually put out a pretty yeah, good great tweet, write up, um, like making diapers is expensive, and I making them on your own. Um, but look, they, this is just another relic of the bubble. It's everybody got drunk on free money, uh, forgot about unit economics, forgot about cogs. Um, I hope that they can, I hope that they can make a go of it because it just seems that if they can get the unit economics right and the cogs right, that there is a market here in this diaper space, but yeah, I think it's a well, uh, a well executed, um, reorganization. So good for them. Yeah. I think, you know, what I saw too, with at least the moist thing, and I've looked into diapers before, um, cause we're actually, we've been looking into a Lomi device that could eat compostable diapers. So like a really fancy diaper pail, <laughs> uh, diapers are very hard to make. Like that's, that is like, so I, I, when I saw this, I couldn't quite, cause I just didn't have the time and don't really care, um, to be honest, but like, I just didn't know how much of this was like a CapEx sink. 
So like how much do they try to build up their own facilities and like go and compete with the one or two companies who makes diapers? Like it's such a consolidated industry um, on the manufacturing side. So like did Hello Bello just try to go build their own facility to manufacture diapers? Or is it like a true unit economics problem, like at a PL level, right? Like they sell it for less than they're costing to make it. I just, I just don't know. Um, but it does seem to be very well executed. I'll agree with both of you on that. Like whoever pulled this off is great. Yeah, it's a cleanup. And we're going to see way more of these. And yep. fucking hats off to them for admitting they were bankrupt and then going yep. through with it. Like the worst case scenario is when you have a founder or an ownership group who won't do that because they don't want the bad press. They don't want to look like idiots. They don't want to yep. know if they failed. And in this situation, you've seen those articles come out because it's a celebrity who looks like they failed publicly. There's another celebrity brand, uh, an apparel brand that needs to do this too, but they won't do it for these reasons. And I mm. won't talk about which one it is, but there's a lot of fucking brands like this who should just go bankrupt and find a restructuring partner and come out of it. But yep. they're they're too proud. So, yep. Side note, bankruptcy, everyone that works around the bankruptcy, talk about the, the biggest grift and the best, easiest job. The lawyers and the bankers who get involved in these bankruptcies are guaranteed to get paid. Like it's a riskless job. When you look at what these bankruptcies look like and who gets what, there's a huh. huge swath of money that comes off the top to the lawyer, the lawyers have to get paid, right? Because think about it, otherwise no one would ever do the work. But it's like, in, I was, back when I was a banker, we did a debt deal and we raised like $6 million for some company and and they decided to like, we had a really, no, no, I'm sorry, we w raised like 600 million and we had a really good fee and they decided to stiff us out of like a third of our fee and then we sued them and then they filed for bankruptcy. It was a really wacky, <laughs> wacky deal, but, we went through that thing for years, and I think ultimately the firm got like two two million bucks out of it, out of like the the five that they were we were supposed to get. But the amount of money being paid out to lawyers and bankers in the bankruptcy was uh, talk about friction, unbelievable. So that may be another reason why it's just hard, and that's another reason why I compliment whoever was involved in the hello bello deal because it's like there's so much friction and so much grift in that process it's ridiculous wow i did not know that very cool um speaking of celebrities since we're on this topic do you guys want to uh lewis hamilton's in the booze business now what key okay, so can one of you guys answer this for me why do celebrities love alcohol so much and then we can talk about how regular non-alcohol well, we know Sean's brands. a big drinker. Maybe he should take that. Yeah, I know. He's like the best customer ever. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know who Lewis Hamilton is. <laughs> so what? Yeah, I don't know who that is. Jason, do you know who Lewis Hamilton is? He Sean only knows people that work in e commerce. He just this is like Sean's the previous show where he's like, I only care about e commerce. So he's not in the e commerce space. But I, I think he might be one of the top F1 he's a driver. drivers in the world. He's a driver. Yeah. Yeah. He's a driver. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Quick little story. I was in, I was in China and I was, you know, when you're in China, we get driven around in buses all the time. Um, and people in China, I think are the greatest fucking drivers ever. Cause if you're there, it is just chaotic on the freeways, people zipping in and out and nobody honks and everyone just rolls with it. And I was trying, I was telling the driver, I'm like, dude, you should be a NASCAR. It's crazy how good you are. And they just, they, they did not know what that was. They did not know about professional driving. They've never heard of it. Um, so I'm not alone, guys. No, uh, well, I mean, look. So, in all fairness, he it's a non-alcoholic brand, but they always, for some reason, they go into like tequilas or like there's all. It's always one of those. It feels like it's always one of those. I'm not. It's not always one of those. But like, as a brand, I mean, Jason, this is sort of your like you know this space really well because of your deal with Gordon and others. Would Would you advise like a, a brand to go and do this? Like find some kind of like A-lister. I mean, Lewis Hamilton, Sean, in the, on a global basis, like that would be an A-list celebrity, right? Like a lot of people will know who Lewis Hamilton is. 
the word that comes to mind is just thought leadership. And that's really what you want. You, it's not just about software. It's about the people designing and building that software and advising you on how to use that software to get the most out of your business. And the Sinlane team is obviously thought leaders in the messaging space. Uh, Jimmy regularly is posting on Twitter and giving insights of how you can be more effective at communicating with your customers on own messaging. And listen, we all know CPMs are only going up. If there's a core competency you have to develop, you have to get great at messaging, and Sinlane is an excellent option. We loved being there for a live operators pod. Hope everybody enjoyed listening to it, and we're thankful to have Sinlane as one of our sponsors. I've tried to invest in Sinlane. Like I've tried to speak about putting what your money where your mouth is. Jimmy will not let me on the cap table. I don't know why, but it's a product I believe in so much in this market that I am trying to put my own money into it. So Jimmy, this is a call for help. Let me invest in your software, dude. It's really good. Yeah, well, all these celebs want to do brands first and foremost, right? This is what's happening. There, Why? There, are, there are companies out there. There are agencies out there. And, and that's what they do. They match celebs with products. Hmm. Or and then there's like I don't know if you know Jason Wong. He's uh he's a D2C guy who um we meet at events a lot, really good guy. He is working on um basically that he's bas- basically working on that, right? He's basically like you if you have a celeb that wants a brand, he will help figure out what product. I think that's what it is. Um but so I think there's two there's two different factors that are going on here. One is that just all these celebs are looking to make more money because they see everyone doing it, right? So it's like the herd mentality here. It, um, it's happening. And then, um, I mean, it, it works, right? Like there's, it's the it's same an old as trick. buying a TV. This is like pre-Facebook, right? Yep. You have a TV spokesman who's a celebrity. So- it's really just a variation on the same theme. Like there's nothing new under the sun. So right. Well, it can work. I think. I think the, there's the way I see it. There's this, there's two pieces. First is most celebrities don't have very much money, right? And like you know, there's Taylor Swift. She's a billionaire. There's Jay Z, billionaire. Kanye West, probably a billionaire. All of these people, but. Once you get past A plus plus and get to like true A tier or B tier, I mean, they're making a couple million dollars a year, right? Like, and that that can go away tomorrow if they're overexposed or they don't book any more movies, right? And and you know maybe a couple millions low, maybe they're making ten million or twenty million or whatever. Sure. But if you have a brand, you can do a hundred million. <laughs> you can do three hundred million. And if it can actually be a if it can remove yourself from it, right? It can make money long after you're you're making movies. Um, so that's like why they want to do it. And the challenge is that very, very few of them can drive any sort of meaningful results. I know a very famous athlete launched a alcohol brand, posted about it. I think they sold twenty three hundred dollars the first day, <laughs> which is nothing. <laughs> right. And it's like, because the buying behavior for alcohol, that isn't what it, like people don't buy alcohol on the internet. Right. Like, hmm. and when is, when was the last time you tried new alcohol? Like you just, if you go to a bar, you just buy a drink, they put whatever in it. Like v- very few people ask for a special type of alcohol, maybe Jason, cause he's rich and, and he's a suave James Bond looking guy. Uh, I mean, yeah. alcohol is, uh, I mean, it's a game of like, you got to get up to a certain, it's got a pre-built exit path in. So I understand like the alcohol path a little bit. Cause like, you know, if you can get to 10,000 cases a year of volume, Diageo will just pick you up and take you to like a hundred thousand or 200,000. Like there's, there is like very clear defined exit paths for alcohol. So like, I kind of get that. I'm more, I'm mean, like, okay. So our audience, people who are listening to this or watching this are other brand operators in some capacity. So like, if I'm them, the question I have is, should I be seeking out a celebrity or, or like celebrities to, you know, do a deal with, like ha- give them equity, right? And is that worth that equity? And how, or how often is it worth that equity? Cause it's all going to be case by case, you know, is, or is that a dangerous place to go? Yeah. And this is where I think people's eyes are bigger than their wallet, 
I think people love the idea of being pairing with a celebrity and like how it can add PR and whatever to, to their brand. And it's so rare for it to be meaningful in, in any sophisticated way. Jason is is the exception. <laughs> is that is that you know it ends up working really well for him. But you have to understand he had a hundred million dollar brand before he came in. The counter is I, we're we're about we are in negotiation to sign a famous person into a full time role at Ridge. So I'm doing it right now. So I think most people shouldn't, but Jason did it, and I'm doing it. Jason, what are your thoughts? It's about an authentic partnership with the right people. Um, I mean, there's a lot of this in the, in the liquor world, right? Because, you know, Ryan Re- Reynolds and Clooney and the, those Dude, guys. Rock, like just there's so right. many of yeah, them, I mean, right? But, but there's a lot of these deals that don't work. There's a few deals in the cookware space that I've seen. I mean, they're all, they, they're constantly happening and they're doing them instead of like doing it with a chef, they're doing it with a celeb. And I, there was just a video of Paris Hilton like giving out her cookware on the streets of Los Angeles because no one will buy it, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, so, um, but uh, you know, look, I think we talk about this all the time: content uh, or creator-driven brands. Um, but it's it's just it's how do you how do you get visibility beyond just just paying someone to to shoot a TV spot? for you and dude you know paris hilton doing cookware doesn't make any sense but you have to think is there anything paris hilton could do that would get me excited the answer is no but like think any celebrity all the alcohol shit is monkey see monkey do it's like oh wait that guy made a billion dollars i'm as famous as that guy i, w- I want to make a billion dollars selling selling alcohol so you just have copycats that just rush into the category who don't really care about it but is there any celebrity that got if they got into a category you would be stoked? Like the answer for me is Ralph Lauren. If Ralph Lauren did more shit, I'd be stoked, but he's 90 years old and he's, he's You know, okay, so like I we're going to this might be a good place that we talk about this too, but it is interesting though, guys, cuz like if you if you do look at the world of luxury brands, every single one leverages celebrity in their creative. Like and they go after this like aspirational, you know, like the um, Sean, your 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 buddy there, Bernard Arnault, uh, is like on video saying the only word they care about in the entire LVMH group is desire. And when you know that, and then you see all of the marketing for every freaking brand in LVMH, every one of them has either one or many celebrities. There's not a photo out there that doesn't have a celebrity in it for these brands. So like on the other side of all this, like for a regular consumer, like I'm with you, Sean, like I don't really give a shit, but then why do they all do it? It's ubiquitous. Like you can't find a, pick one and I will show you the celebrities that they rep. Dude, you're, you're totally right. I was just rock walking through the Hong Kong airport and there's just millions of luxury stores and every one of them has somebody from a movie in it. It's it's a good counterpoint. I don't know I don't know why they do it, but they it, it must work. <laughs> I mean, have degree. you seen like are you guys getting the Nespresso ads that I am right now? Or like it's the gal from um Ozarks and somebody else. So like they're clearly trying to pass the George Clooney baton to these other two young gals for an espresso. But they're like they're both actresses. And then, you know, Brunello Cuccinelli, like every, every single one I come across, I'm like, it's just a bunch of famous people. So this must be how this world works <laughs> or they're yeah. all crazy. Well, it's also so different that, you know, it's still life photography that they, that they just run single images or maybe, maybe they'll do a 60 second, like fragrance ad or whatever, but they're never doing UGC or <laughs> it's not UGC. No, it's like really high end photography or like, uh, I forget which one, but, um, there was like Kendall Jenner riding a horse in a dress. Like it made no fucking sense. You're not going horse riding in something that like that, but like it, it just, I don't know what it is, but it, and I wonder if this is a part of what makes these luxury brands so damn resilient is that they're trading, their brand is trading on something else that the rest of us and consumer just don't understand or like, or we're just not old enough or, or don't have the brand age or the whatever to do it. Like maybe Jason, you might be the exception here with Gordon and Hexclad, 
but like they have something that like Brunello Cuccinelli is kicking ass, man. Like, you know, they're, they're up, they're beating their forecast for the year. And what most people would say, like the consumer's on vacation and they're not spending money. I'm like, I don't know, call up old Bernard and he'll tell you otherwise. Yeah. Well, the flip side is, is, is curing took a fucking beating. Right. So I think, I think. Yeah. I don't understand. Is that just a Gucci problem? I think Sean, you mentioned that. Like, is, is that purely like Gucci's just on its way out or caring is like the brands or would you use a term that I thought was interesting? Overexposed. Yeah. Gucci's been overexposed for like two and a half years. Last time we got, we did a podcast and we talked about our favorite luxury brands and Jason said, oh yeah, Gucci, there's, there's they've been, they've been on top and then, you know, they, 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 uh, they, they're not missing. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's, they're overexposed then. <laughs> it's like, if they're not doing something incredibly radical, that's off putting, like, you know, I think, uh, I think it's a telltale sign of a luxury brand, you know, being out the door and it'll come in waves. Gucci will come back in six years or 10 years or whatever, but they just got way too overexposed. Uh, you know, I don't know, Jason, if you've got thoughts on this, but like another example I saw recently was, um, like when Apple launched the Apple watch, apparently that was supposed to be like the death knell for Rolex and all these other watch companies. Like, I don't know if you guys remember this. It was like the headlines were instant. Like Apple's now the largest watch company in the world, right? And that like other watch companies should be freaking out. And the entire like luxury watch industry's response to Apple's watch was just to raise prices. <laughs> like, <laughs> good luck. Good luck finding one of these right now. You you, you literally can't no. get a Rolex, a Mariner. Good luck. I'm glad I got this. No, yeah, picking up the sub is hard. 1997. 1997. Can't get See, them. So it's it just, it's such a counter move that like you just, the largest company in the world just kicked down your door and the response was to raise prices. Yeah, man. I mean, uh, <laughs> the world of the, the world of luxury is just so different from traditional mm -hmm. consumer. Like, you know, really being a Veblen good where, like, uh, I think I, I think it's Chanel has raised their prices seventy two percent in the past five years or something, right? Basically doubling, and sales volume stayed exactly the same in terms of units. So revenue is just way fucking up, uh, and it's something we. It's hard to to borrow lessons from that, but I'm gonna try. I'll let you guys know how it goes. In Do a you years. okay? So hang on. Do you think that any category of good? can be turned into a luxury good. Can you make luxury toilet paper? <laughs> I think any category of good. Well, I don't know if you guys read this or not. I think I said it over in chat. It was it was luxury versus technical. And Dude, was that was the, wild. Yeah, the, the breakdown. And I don't know who posted it. I, show notes credit. It was an awesome article. Um, but it was a breakdown versus Canadian Goose versus Montclair and how Montclair is crushing it and Canadian Goose is slipping. And it's because Canadian Goose is technically better, but they have to hit on these technical points over and over again. Yeah. Where Montclair is a luxury brand, so whatever they do, they just do expensive, you know, audacious versions of. So if you're a luxury brand, anything you do can be luxury. And Tiffany sells. Yeah, this sells is super interesting. This is super interesting because we um we did a rebrand. Well, we we did branding work for Hexclad in yep. early 2022. And so we're coming up almost on two years since we embarked on it. Um, and a lot of what we did back then was very focused on the functionality of the product. And it's because people didn't didn't know, right? People didn't know why our product was special. People were like, okay, Gordon Ramsay, cool. But we put a lot of focus into the function. Um, but as we continue to grow, it's like we've been there, done that. So how do we level up? And we level up by focusing on the lifestyle, maybe it's luxury, maybe it's not, but just like focusing on the vibes, right? Like like the mm -hmm. MasterCard priceless campaign um, was one that they threw at us. Um, how Nike did at one point, you know, Nike was just making running shoes and then they got Jordan and they did all this, but they also, they, 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 they campaigned on anyone can be an athlete. So, that that focus on on function i think canada goose did have a it 
it's just that's just fashion, right? Like there was all the rappers. Like I remember back in like the late nineties, very few like you, a certain type of person wore that, right? Like it, and it it wasn't super mainstream. It was like rappers and 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 like that, and and then it became super mainstream luxurious you know high end and people i was always like how are people spending that much money for this coat um moncler is a brand that's also very interesting to me funny story i was in the paris moncler store like five years ago i don't know if you remember james bond war in one of the sh movies it's like a down vesty, yep. and then it's got like a sweater sleeve. So I'm in there. I bought, and I was about to buy it, and the salesperson says, "Oh, could this there's this old guy standing next to me. He's like, can I show this? Uh, can I just borrow this for one second? I promise we're gonna give it right back to you." So they gives it to this guy. This old guy's trying it on. He's like, "That's Mr. Monkler. That is literally the the guy who started Monkler. He doesn't own the business anymore, but like I have my Mr. Monkler wore." my jacket so i've got that going for me but they they just have a different like level of luxury view hmm. to, to the brand like when you go to their store everything else it's just like their jacket is pretty similar to a lot of jackets and you just have that little emblem and uh it really means something <laughs> you know it uh the canada goose thing um so when i lived in toronto i'm just going back to that word you used Sean, which is overexposed. I don't know if that's that might be two words. Uh, but Canada Goose, 10 years ago in Toronto, I remember actually having this conversation with a friend of mine, and I was like, there's no way this brand survives for long. Like they were everywhere. Like people were wearing Canada Goose jackets in September in Toronto. So, like you're talking about it, it was so hot, and everybody was buying it. And it was like, 65 degrees outside and you're wearing a coat that's rated for minus 50 because it was so fashionable at that point in time. I'm like, they're fucked. Like, you know, when you're wearing a, a minus 50 are like built for the Arctic coat in September, you're screwed as a brand. Like that's not good. Way overexposed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think overexposure is just a good especially in the luxury space it's like the reason why actors only do one movie every couple of years it's because or else you end up being Nicolas Cage and you end up being in every goddamn fucking movie and people don't like you anymore they're like I've seen enough of that for now Tommy Hilfiger in the 90s uh you know Abercrombie in the 2000s it's just you end up reaching a point of overexposure and people get sick of it I, th I think Mr. Beast is probably like an example of overexposure right now how does it get bigger how does how does how do more people go into it? How do more people like it forever? Eventually, just turn people off. So, do, do, is there have either of you guys ever just considered playing with um, like restricting supply? Like Jason, have you ever thought about just making it harder to get a hex clad product? No, but it drives me crazy when I see the the typical D 2 C marketing ploy of oh this just sold out and get the thing that sold out twenty five times. So I don't, sure. I don't want to go there, Matt. It drives me crazy. What? Why though? Like, because that's a that's the hallmark of a luxury good is that the, it's not everywhere. Yeah, but we're talking pricing about power is largely a lot of brands driven that by scarcity. A lot of brands that aren't luxury with the bullshit tactics. I don't know. I just don't have any. I don't have patience for the bullshit, but um, it's more like they have been unable to get their production right. Um, no, it's a good point. Do are there certain things we're doing a limited drop of of a new new knives actually? So um, we, we yeah, I don't, I don't think you have to, like every brand should do it with everything, mm -hmm. but there is. I mean, you're looking. I mean, I, I appreciate it. You're looking at it from like the operators lens that just means you have a shitty supply chain but like the brand builder in me is also like uh, i don't know i think restricting supply might actually be an interesting yeah i only bring it up jason because like you have a product and a brand that might actually be able to pull it off over time yeah jason and i would and this is where i would i would pressure you and challenge you to think about ornamentation as a way of exclusivity mm. because yeah. this month we brought back in stock 
it's it's called the Marco Sorelli wallet. It's like a wallet collab we did with a, a tattoo artist. The first one came out in in February. We sold like ten thousand units. We're like we're not going to bring it back. We ended up being like okay, we'll bring it back just for like a little October, a little bit of fun. Best selling wallet this month. Like mm-hmm. we're talking thousands and thousands of units at full price in October, and it's going to sell out again. And I really think experimenting with you know, ornamentation. And the the example would be LVMH. You can always buy, I think it's called the Evertote, right? Like yeah. the big whatever, right? You can always buy that. What you can't always buy is the collabs, right? Like those are hard to get. There's a secondary market. And I'm going to try to explore more of that over the next couple of years. And I think you could do a great job. And I would really focus on like exclusive handles, right? Like if we could, if we can get marble handles going, if we could get, mm-hmm. you know, gold leaf handles, whatever, only make a thousand of those, your your core collectors will go hot and you'll be the only pan selling on StockX. I think we can get that done for you, Jason. Yeah, we need, we need idea. The, gold, the gold ones. We do have the gold ones in our office and everyone sees them and loves them. But uh, yeah. That's a good idea. It's definitely on the roadmap, but that this is this like leads into a panzerism. I was going to say, that's a great lead um, in. This is leads into a panzerism. It's perfect. It's, uh, I actually have, I was going to do a different one today, but that's just, I just want to get this one done while it's, while it's on my mind. Um, like there's a, there's a, when you, when you pose a question like that, like you got, you say, oh, you guys should do this. You guys should do that. Right. I think the first answer that, that I have to come back to people now with is like, tell me why I need to do this now. Why do I need to do it now? Because Everyone is pinging people on my team. Everyone's pinging me. Everyone's got ideas. But like things are going really well. And I think people need to ask themselves this question way more. Not like, why would I do it? That's 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 one thing. But like, why do I need to do it now? Why does this have to happen right now? Why does this have to happen this week or this month or this day or this year? I think if people start asking themselves that question, it will help them eliminate distractions and make better decisions. And particularly if you're a manager and you guys are both really good managers and Matt writes a lot about this type of stuff. Um, as a, as a manager, I, I think it makes it, it helps you manage your people better, easier. It's easier and it helps them make better decisions. Just be like, explain to me why we need to do this right now. Otherwise, mm-hmm. Come back to me when we need to. For example, we're growing really fast. We've been growing really fast for a really long time. It's like how much, going back to Sean, like it's really hard to grow. It's hard to manage this kind of growth. So it's like, why do it? Why do these things? So ask yourself, ask your teams this question. Why do we have to do this now? There are some things like when our growth is is not where it is now, I'll definitely have le- to start pulling levers and figure stuff figure stuff out and it's good to start thinking about it and like having a list going somewhere like i have a list a lot of these things like the personalization and things like that was like why do we have to do this right now ask yourself that question guys everyone on the podcast uses north beam okay like i use fulfill i'm trying to invest in send lane and i use north beam i'm the trifecta here why do we use north beam if you spend a lot of money on paid media, right? So I'm talking probably multiple millions on Facebook in a month. You need a source of truth reporting hourly to accurately pivot budgets and campaign spend. And that one feature alone, my whole paid media team logs into it, my whole creative team logs into it, and they can see which ads are driving sales, you know, creative, whatever, on an independent basis with real-time data and then pivot budgets accordingly. And in a month like November, you can end up saving 80 grand in an hour or something crazy. Uh, So thank you, Northbeam, for being a sponsor. They also have a mixed media modeling tool, which this only applies for the big boys in chat. If you're spending $10 million a month, you need a mixed media modeling tool. And if I'm the first guy to tell you that, how the fuck did you get to $10 million a month in spend? Like, I'm too dumb for you to take advice from me. But that is that is the next level. Attribution tool first, then mixed media modeling. And Northbeam can carry you through that. Yep. 
Uh, it's a great question. I think every uh, every operator should have some system for idea intake, and that system should include like scoring, you know, easy versus impact, um, up like asymmetric upside downside risk, like just some kind of like a set of questions you could say like this tactic, these ten questions. And that gives you like a, like just a place to put stuff, right? I think to add on, I think it's totally fair to tell people, I know I don't have to do that. <laughs> just be yeah. like, you're wrong and fuck off, right? Because yep. uh, Jason, I'm sure a, a ton of people come to you with very bad ideas all the time. And it's, they come from positions of weakness where like they've never done it before. So like they have no idea. People tell me all the time how hard it would be to do X, Y, or Z make shit in America, sell shit into Asia, whatever. And I'm like, well, you've never done it. So I don't really care about your opinion. <laughs> like that's, I think, uh, and yeah, I think that's a good framework you, you have. Like, why should I do this right now? Like prove to me that this is worth my time to do because everything's going so great. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good panzerism. All right. Well, episode 28, I think we wrap it up. This has been a good one. Jason, I love the panzerism, man. I've been thinking a lot about that one lately. So that's great. Good. Thanks, guys.